It is now my great pleasure uh, to welcome today's speaker, distinguished ethicist, sociologist, and feminist theorist, Denise Ferreira da de Silva. Denise de Silva held the inaugural chair in ethics and was previously director of the Center for Ethics and Politics at Queen Mary University of London. She is currently associate professor at the Institute for Research on Gender, Race, Sexuality, and Social Justice at the University of British Columbia in Vancouver. It is in no way an understatement to say that she is one of the most formidable contemporary theorists of the black radical tradition. Uh, her writing focuses broadly on the conceptual, political, and ethical challenges of the global present, which is exemplified most profoundly by her bold and expansive 2009 monograph toward a global idea of race. Toward a global idea of race is a rigorous intervention in the fields of political theory, critical legal theory, critical racial and ethnic studies, global and political, global and post-colonial studies, cultural studies, and feminist theory. And we are thrilled to have her presenting a new chapter of this work, uh, our new venture of this work, uh, to us in this evening. It is a talk that is tantalizingly entitled Hacking the Subject, Black Feminism, Refusal, and the limits of critique. Denise's description of her talk frames it as an exploration of what she sees as the fundamental challenge posed by black feminisms. It's questioning of a feminist critical grammar that reproduces any proper apprehension of the female or the feminine and exposing the limits of what constitutes a proper subject. And we are very, very anxious and excited to hear her lecture this evening, not only because of the rigorous intellectual work that the title signifies. We are also excited because Denise's lecture and the workshop on her work um, that we actually just finished earlier today kicks off a series of conversations and reflections, uh, conversations and reflections that are going to begin tomorrow and to come for BCRW's newest working group, which we are calling Practicing Refusal, Thinking Beyond Resistance. This afternoon, we spent two really challenging and invigorating hours studying and discussing Denise's work in preparation for a day-long conversation tomorrow of what it means to think beyond conventional notions of resistance as the primary model for theorizing the relationship of black subjects to power. Denise's work has been a touchstone for so many of it, us, in that it pushes us to rethink the time, space, and fundamental vocabulary of what it means to think differently about what constitutes politics, activism, and theory, as well as what it means, as well as what it means to practice the refusal of the terms given to us to name these struggles. We look forward to being challenged anew by her comments today. Please join me, everyone, in welcoming Denise Ferrer da Silva. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks, Tina and Saidia, for the invitation to be here, to be part of the working group and to speak to you. And thanks for the members of the working group uh, for you know, the excuse. And thank you for the embarrassing, embarrassing introduction <laughs> that I will fail completely just now. And that's how, that's how it goes. What can I do? Uh, <laughs> Okay, I will um, first time myself, and then, um, as usual, begin uh, better now uh, with a, a couple of quotes. Look at me, look at my arm. I have plowed and planted and gathered into barns, and no man could heed me, had me. And then I, a woman. I could work as much and eat as much as a man when I could get it and bear the lash as well. And then I, a woman, I have borne 13 children and seen most of all sold off to slavery. And when I cried out, of, out with my mother's grief, none but Jesus heard me. And then I, a woman, what does it mean when the tools of a racist patriarchy are used to examine the fruits of that same patriarchy? It means that only the most narrow parameters of change are possible and allowable. Those of us who stand outside the circle of this society's definition of acceptable woman, those of us who have been forged in the crucibles of difference, those of us who are poor, who are lesbians, who are black, who are older, 
know that survival is not an academic skill. It is learning how to take our differences and make them strengths. Take our differences and make them our strengths. Following the poet's intention, I hope to set the stage with a reminder of how the black feminist position troubles black and feminist critical projects. For each of them recalls how black feminism performs a double refusal, the refusal to disappear and the refusal to comply. But if specifically, refusal to disappear into the general categories of otherness or objecthood, that is blackness and womanhood, and the refusal to comply with the formulations of racial and sexual emancipatory projects these categories guide. My inhabitation of the black feminist position in this experiment <laughs> follows a long trail of the unacceptable women, which here I captured with the, fi by the, with the figure of an ex, and I'll say more about that later. And I do so to stage a confrontation with the very notions of the object and the other that organize our critical texts. More particularly, this inter iteration, of what, iteration of what I have been calling radical praxis, in this iteration, I, take blackness, I try to take blackness back away from the scenes of science and history and to release it in and to the world with the ethical mandate of opening up the imagination to welcome and pursue other ways of knowing and doing. For we know that in the world as we know it, the category of blackness exists in as thought, always already a referent of commodity, object, and the other, but always without the demand for evidence. Think of the black object in figurings of the thinking of the black object in figurings in its figurings such as Amadou Diallo's wallet, a Trayvon Martin's hoodie. Shouldn't the acquittal of the cops who killed Diallo, who shot him 41 times back in 99, and the acquittal of Zimmerman force us to radicalize the task and target the very mode of representation that provides those meanings to blackness as in persons, places, and things? The meanings that are deployed to justify, as in rendering just, killing of young and black people across the world. What I do in this exercise does is then to engage the very object, sub subject object distinction that justify deployments of total violence against black persons and in black territories. A move that I hope contributes to the conversation on blackness and refusal, in particular because I see it as an exploration of the radical, I present it as an exploration of the radical possibilities hosted by the object but when contemplated in the scene of violence and yet refusing descrip descriptions of the scenes of colonial and racial power, such as the colonial violence in certain readings of Fanon, um, or white supremacy uh, in many readings recently, in which the becoming subject in struggle or injury figures male desire for self-presence and transparency. Taking Horton Spiller's female fra flesh and gender as an invitation to take a risk, to contemplate the thing as a guide for a kind of thinking that lies beyond, because without, and before, because against modern representation. In my experiment today, I try to perform the question she offers, her gift to black feminism, which is questioning the questioning of a feminist critical grammar that cannot but reproduce the proper apprehension of the female and the feminine and the questioning that exposed the limits of the proper woman. Enacting refusal as negative answer to truth and Lord's rhetorical questions, no, you are not a woman, nothing, the tools of racist patriarchy have nothing for us. This presentation takes these questions as a call to rebellion and moves to dissolve the figure of the subject itself, which is done in a series of movies, moves, translation, transformation, and transposition through which I re refigure the woman and with her the female and the feminine to the point of defacement where she can do what no other category can do best, which is the disordering of the modern grammar through the unsettling of the figure that bears self-determination in its ethical and juridical renderings. So what I'll do here is very simple. I begin with a brief description of the modern grammar in which I focus primarily on the subject of decision. 
then I will misread Naomi Chandler's figure of an, uh, figure of an X, X, the problem of the Negro, the problem for thought. And I'll do so just to highlight how the figure of an X that guides his analysis of Du Bois enables the articulation of a black subject of a particular articulation of the black subject. And finally, I appropriate and redeploy his figure of an ex in an exercise of recomposition of the feminist critique of patriarchy. And then I'll just conclude very briefly with a commentary on the, some implications of the whole exercise. Derrida's criticism of structuralism, even as he inhabits it, would be a sweeping one. It would relate to the possibility of a general law, the law of difference. The law of difference is that any law is constituted by postponement and self-difference. For Derrida, however, a text is a play of presence and absence, a play of the faced trace. It effaces the need to distinction between subject and object. Even as it remains legible as a structure, it erases the aim of the structuralism, which is well, to provide objective descriptions. My experiment, as I said, was inspired by reading Naomi Chandler's acts, where he provides a beautiful uh, reading of the rendering of Du Bois's rendering of Africanist discourse, in which he also noticed how Du Bois anticipates these uh, themes addressed in the construction, such as the challenge to the notion of pure and simple essence, the binary ordering of difference and sameness as a basis for identity and identification, and the subject-object pair. Now, reading acts against the background of recent reactionary, the recent reactionary move, mood in continental philosophy, such as, for instance, Bruno Latour's Alain Badiou's and Quentin Meliasu's direct attacks on postmodernism and poststructuralism, um, in attacks in which they resurrect old themes of uh, modern philosophy, I became worried about what would take for us to enact the kind of critique that would, for once, prevent the subject from returning. So the more I, con I read con this contemporary text, the more I'm convinced that nothing short of the dissolution of the entire grammar of modern thought will allow us for the kind of reimagining of the world in which blackness will not recall justified violence. And on that note, I just want to say that we need more of the kind of work that Alex O'Haley has done in his very nice feminist take on Agamben, <laughs> black feminist take on Agamben. So the exercise I'm presenting to you today is meant as a contribution to the task. But, it, but I, frame it, I frame it a bit differently because I was, I'm trying to work out and away from what many of us have already noted constitute the limits of critique. So let me be more explicit then. My concern is with the fact that the postmodern, poststructuralist critical projects now under attack, the ones that really provide us many of the tools we deploy in our work, they did not completely break, because I think they could not, with modern representation. And Nefertiti has a very nice analysis of how studies of gender in the global economy cannot but reproduce the racial subaltern by reinstating a particular, the position of the subject while rewriting the oppressed as an object or commodity. And I think on a different register, Sadia Hartman also reflects on the same limits of critique when commenting on the challenge of returning to an archive which cannot but reproduce the very violence on six to expose and purge when reimagining the black female slave. And very recently, I found another iteration of these limits, the limits which actually colonize our imagination in Tina Kemp's yet some soon to come out book, <laughs> um, in which it, she comments on young black folks' online imagings that refuse the position of the already dead. So my point is the limits of critique do not separate us from more or less friendly European philosophers of yesteryears or the downright hostile reactionaries of today. They join us at the hip. <laughs> 
Precisely these limits are the target of this response to Chandler's reading um, in Du Bois' discourse of an object emerging as a subject of a critical address, an effect, as, as, in the, in the effect, as an effect of the decision on racial identification. So unfortunately, I cannot retrace uh, Neil Chandler's absolutely beautiful, magnificent reading of Du Bois. So I'll go straight to my unfair misreading of his argument. <laughs> Which, by the way, he anticipates when he notes that the figure of an axe's capacity for disruption is there, and perhaps is there at the chromosomal level. So when writing Du Bois an, as an exemplary example of Africanist counter discourse, Chandler describes a social historical subject emerging in the register of racial violence, slavery, and segregation. And that subject is expressed in Du Bois's notion of, social, of double consciousness and also in the notion of second sight. However, the significant moment which occurs in, in Dusk of Dawn for Chandler is Du Bois's disclosure of his mixed paternity. So, but why is it significant? Uh, I think for two reasons at least, and probably none of which may be the ones you have in mind right now. Um, on the one hand, the disclosure fractures Du Bois's positioning. Because the disclosure, disclosure as an event presents him as a differentially inscribed social subject of the US racial text. In the moment of racial identification, he occupies the affectable position in the racial text, but also the self determined position in the patriarchal text. Nevertheless, his disclosure does challenge his racial identification. Actually, uh, does not challenge, sorry, does not challenge his racial, racial identification. Actually, it consolidates it because now it is, we learn, now it's learned that he has a black heritage from both sides, both his ma mother and from his father's side. So while the disclosure challenges white racial purity, it leaves the black, black racial difference intact. Now, on the other hand, and consequently, the disclosure that marks the, the emergence of a, black, of a subject in a critical discourse, a deciding racial thing against racial purity, also brings her, his unnamed black or mestizo grandmother, into thought. And that is, uh, for Chandler, the challenge to racial thinking. Now, in the decision, however, in the decision to disclose, she emerges as an object, as wife and mother, that marks the subject's um, position. Or saying it differently, she comes before thought as another, her son's mother and their father's common law wife. So what I'm trying to say is that the decision on racial identification belongs to the authorized subject of the decision. Under the headings of family, to the father, and under the headings of the nation state, well, to Jefferson. From the constraints of the national tax, whether calling for racial purity or hybridity, and here I'm thinking obviously about Brazil, the mother's blackness has no import to the decision on racial identification. But what I want to highlight is how the articulation of the social, historical, racial, sexual, gendered class subject requests a formal condition of enunciation, which I'm calling here the patriarch form which simultaneously conjures two positions, namely that of the subject and its predicate, the other or the object. And that with the, and that with the consequences already indicated by Sojourner Truth and Audre Lorde's opening quotes. So, but before I move on to hijack Chandler's figure of an ax and explore her radical uh, possibilities, I need to elaborate on the, a bit on the patriarch form. So what I'm trying to capture with this term is a signifying structure analogous to Derrida's um, archive writing. So I'll give you, <laughs> sorry for my bad PowerPoint, but okay, so that's a figure I have in mind. Uh, keep it in mind when I talk. Um, is a signifying, signifying structure analogous to Derrida's arc of writing, but one which does not function in the same way for two interrelated reasons. Uh, I have it in mind as a shape, psi, the letter psi, an assemblage as well as a rule and or a formula. 
Um, so the image I have in mind, uh, even though this is not quite it, it's more of a crystal lattice. And B, it is the archive form of juridical and social power in that it provides symbolic support for the self-determined subject and the affectable subject emerging under racial, sexual, class, ability, and other indexes of social subjugation. So, Trying to make it more clear, the patriarchal form emerges in a read. I, my, um, this beautiful <laughs> image there uh, reflects a reading of the inaugural text of modern political philosophy, which, in a way, it does not. My reading does not differ much from feminist uh, critics of the social contract, such as McKinnon, Bateman, and other. Uh, polit feminist political theories. But I think that is a, a, a main difference would be that I am not uh, framing patriarchy as a distinct, or I'm not interested in framing it as a distinct system of social domination, which would work in tandem with economic, racial, and, and others. But I'm interested in how uh, it, is, it is actually integral to modern representation. So, when, so reading Hobbes and Locke, when, when we can see that when entering in the social contract, you know, the descriptions of the emergence of the political society that we find in Hobbes and Locke's account, the patriarch you know, becomes this legal, juridical, political entity, which in addition to the attributes of rationality, liberty, and equality, the patriarch also retains authority. Because the modern juridic subject, the one emerging in the moment of deciding to relinquish the power to execute the law of nature, is, in my view, a genus faced formation, which, in the moment of its enunciation, it figures power as domination in the register of authority and power as self determination in the register of the will. My point then is that the individual signator of the social contract. You know, we know, was a husband and a merchant, a plantation owner, and a slave master and a settler. Uh, so, though the patriarch, uh, though the patriarch, the political subject, um, is bound legally through the patriarch to that form, the juridical subject is bounded legally to his land, women, children, servants, and slaves. In, as such, it is always already affected, entangled with its others and objects in a juridically mediated relationship, in juridically mediated relationships such as conquest, marriage, title, etc. So, and that it is for this reason that I take it as the article form of the subject that emerges in the, in the decision, but not. I have to make it clear. I'm talking about the subject emerging in a decision and not the subject as a position in signification, not the I uh, of that begins a particular phrase. So with this figure, what I'm trying to do is to capture the original juridical structure, how the original juridical structure envelops other dimensions of subjugation, which we uh, usually identify with social categories. And as such, it hides, holds the indistinction between social and, political and the political dimensions of existence. So for this reason, the subject, in the moment of decision, evokes without the need for it to be articulated, because it is implicit in its structure or form, an other subjugated, oppressed, juridical entity, or saying it differently, any enunciation contingent upon the patriarch form, which is a form of the decision, instantaneously, though silently, introduces an object uh, or another position under its, um, always under its authority. Now, the patriarch is also the figure that it's deployed to distinguish the West from its others, but only, and not only Eastern civilizations. It appears in Herder's writings of human cultural difference. It's there in founding anthropological and sociological theorizing and in political statements, as the ones we have been here for many, many years. Um, so, but if I can return a bit to metaphysics uh, as to take a shortcut, I find that the patriarch form which is a name I'm giving to this figuring of authority as decision determination, is not, does not mark a specific difference that we can use to compare different kinds of um, societies. For, okay. Okay, I have to go here. 
but it also morphs more fundamentally a generic difference because it is the mode onto which all later framings of the subject have to uh, it has to fit had to fit, namely it is the one it is a mode for the subject that judges the Kantian subject that judges the Hegelian subject that recognizes and the scientific subject of knowledge that measures and classifies, etc. So it is for this reason that I find that attacking the patriarch form would expose how power functions, uh, the, power, the, the power functions of the outer layers of man, namely in the figuring as a subject, in the register of truth, as the citizen, in the juridical register of rights, and the human, in the ethical register of um, value. So, giving continuity to the anti-colonial task that I have announced elsewhere, which is basically to bring about the end of the world as we know it, my move here is obvious, I think. Um, with the Spillers, I'm convinced that the category of gender figured by the wife and the mother has very little to offer to a black radical feminist project. The black slave alone, uh, quoting Spillers, it stands in the, fl in the flash, both mother and mother dispossessed, thus out of the traditional symbolic of female gender, end quote. That is, under the slavery for the captive female, the customary, and I'm quoting, aspects of sexuality, including reproduction, motherhood, pleasure, and desire are, um, are all thrown in crisis. Now, reproduction and motherhood already belong in the comprehension of sex the sexual in patriarchy. But because hers is not the body of the mother or the wife, but of the lovers, the one which always has always, always written as the object of male desire and pleasure, and here I'm recalling Ligari again, the female na slave native the female slave and native body is no signifier of determination or decision or of law, rule, function, or the Kantian form of the Hegelian production or structure as in property, patriarchy, or reproductivity. It is for this reason that I find that, I find that she can gather and help to gather an image that interrupts instantaneously the elements of representation that support the patriarch form and the figurines of the subject it sustains. So obviously what I'm doing here, what, what's informing what I'm doing here is nothing new. Uh, many of those who have contributed to the task are here in this room, and some of, many of them teach at this university and others. But what I'm doing is just taking the practice, just hitting this practice of refusal that I think is black feminism, and by inhabiting the no and the nothing that the black female body has been consistently punished for signify. And I do that by moving to ignore impropriety and to fight appropriation in support of an emerging black subject in the form of a castrated patriarch. Since all that's left is insurgency, I move to hijack Chandler's figure of an ex, Du Bois's great grandmother, with which he kept, and to hack it, hoping to release its radical possibilities. So, but what do I mean by hacking? So, hacking, as I'm using it here, is, is, a, is a decomposition that explores and unsettles and perverts forms or formulae. So it is hacking in the computer sense of hacking. Um, it is an active and purposeful misunderstanding, misreading, and misappropriation, but it's also a response to a call. A response that obviously misappropriates a friend's argument, misreads his project, and it is an experiment in nonsense. So, no sense. Um, what it does is what it does. It doesn't promise anything. There is no big theory coming out or before it. Um, it's a, it's a kind of reading, which is at, is at once an imaging in Benjamin's sense of the work done by the dialectical image and the composition as a description of the creative act. But it is also the, it is done through decomposition of elements in the sense that the term has in chemistry. My decomposition of the arc form of the subject involves three moves, a translation, which is the first crucial move, which is basically the use of, sim of m symbols of math and biology, a transposition. So once my, con the, my terms became biological symbols, I can then place them in an algorithm, which is basically most of what I do, moving them 
from one pla place to another in that, in that formula. And so it's primarily a performance. And in this performance, a few simple mathematical signs allow me to explode the arc form of the subject uh, through a series of transformations. So relying on the meanings of uh, these uh, pieces I'm using, and oh, I'm not going to show you the pieces now. I'll show it later. Uh, no, I have to show you the pieces now. So PowerPoint, totally out of order. OK. My pieces, <laughs> so you have a sense. They're coming later. Um, so my pieces are, um, you know, the letters that mark sexual, biological, genetic sexual assignation, X, 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 Y, math signs, plus, minus, um, equal, leading to, and the cipher, zero. And then a logical mark, uh, the hack, uh, backslash, or swash has different names. And the latter side that I used before in the patriarchal form. So I'm going to explain the meanings throughout the exercise. But basically all I do is just, you know, basically moving things from one side to another of two equations. One I call it the equation of sexual reproduction, and the other one I call it the equation of sexual desire. So I have showed, I showed you the image of the patriarchal form. Uh, but let me go back. So this um, is the image of man, the citizen form. As you can see, the patriarch little thing is gone because that authority was you know, supposedly relinquished to the state. But the state with which the citizen identifies because both of them share in the same abstract universal, universal nature. So that's the male, white, male, European citizen form and which is the modern male form, and the female form. So this is supposed to be an X. Uh, so stretch your imagination and connect them, because I couldn't find a good image of an X. So as you can see, I have those numbers there. And those numbers that I'm using here, maybe here is better, 1 and 0. I'm just playing with the binary codes, and I'll talk to you about that um, now. So what this images, um, with these images, I'm actually re trying to convey a certain reading um, of discourses um, on gender and race, race, that we are going to talk about it soon. But, in, but I do so by returning to metaphysics. So with the binary 0, 1, which is more explicit here, I try to translate Aristotle's notion of substance as matter form. So zero as method refers to the excessive feminine, which Butler has noted has been explored by Iragaray and Derrida in order to name an excess that is constituted and by and constitutive of um, it's constituted and constitutive of its exclusion from the Western economy of signification. So in a, but in a way, most, much of what I'm doing goes against Butler's take on matter materiality in, in bodies that matter, because unlike her and Derrida, I don't think that it's possible to contemplate, I do think that it's possible to contemplate an absolute outside. And this is what blackness has been forced to signify, though it is definitely impossible to conceptualize it. So that's why I have these images. Um, so in any event, the binary zero, one, basically allow me to split Aristotle's substance or matter, or matter and form, potentiality and actuality. Um, and just to, re to remind, uh, for Aristotle, in, uh, each thing is a unit of the potential and the actual, and, but the potential and the actual for him are somehow one. And he gives four meanings to the one. The, whole, the naturally continuous, indivi indivisible, and simpler. The whole, which has a certain shape and form, are indivisible and a kind of, or in kind or in number. The individual, in number, and it's, it is also indivis indivisible. And the universal is indivisible uh, in intelligibility and in knowledge. So here I'm taking the second meaning 
that is the unichained one refers to the whole with a certain shape or form, which I move them against Aristotle, obviously, to disassemble by noting that the one refers to the value given to the attributes associated with male rationality equality, and zero to that which is said to distinguish uh, the female, and I'm calling it maternity. So the way I play with that, and I don't have this there, is basically by um, multiplying one times one times one. In the case of male, I get what one. <laughs> and then when I multiply uh, rationality, and liberty, equality, and maternity, in the case of the female, obviously I get a zero. So that's how I end up with the one zero thing. Um, so. When I combine that in the register of the, in writings of the ratio, I get that. Um, so in here, basically, the minus meaning, you know, without, without ration, male without rationality, without liberty, without equality, becomes minus one, the negation of the form that embodies rationality, liberty, and equality. Um, so black masculinity, um, very, effectively signifies exclusion of the kind of constitutive exclusion Butler uh, writes about, or the kind of differential in, uh, inclusion, exclusion that Lisa Lowe and others have written about. Now the black female, I find um, minus one times minus one times minus one times zero, uh, and the effect is zero. Uh, this equation has no relation uh, to form. There is no relation to one in there. So this is my reference. When I say uh, that, uh, when I talk about that which is without determination, without the Kantian prog program, I'm not talking about it because it's excluded, but because of the known value that, that does not mean negation, it means nothingness. Um, that's what I want to, to highlight. Because she is without the patriarchal norm and its value assignation. And this is obviously what I have been, uh, I have calling, I've been calling the female, uh, the section in the female slave and native body. So in this exercise, it, which also stands for the thing, is the reference uh, that equals to zero. So where zero, however, we have, I have to say that, um, means at once the disappearance of value, the nullification, the absence of value, nothing less, beyond any means for measuring value access, and, and more importantly, the plenum. Virtuality is possible, new origin or beginning. As a referent of the plenum, hence, without the scene of determination, she refers to the undifferentiated abyss and the promise of the solution of the forms of the subject. Um, and here, so that's my figure of an ax. So basically, she does not exist. If you think that Du Bois's father and his brother were white only, but only because her, through her nullification, she basically does not exist. So it is not that she was irrational, unfree, unequal as negation. All she was was a mother, which already means nothing, anything, everything, which is um, the cipher. So what I'm going to do, like in the next 10 minutes, is basically to activate her the figure of an axe as a decompos decompositional tool. Um, and the axe as a hacked axe, uh, let's see. Um, and using the hacked axe, uh, you know, towards um, exploding the male form x, y. So I'll do that in three moves. So I'll solve the, the biological equation of uh, reproduction as a way to use my pieces to image conventional heterosexual biogender discourse, and then I'll try once again uh, the biogender equation without the mother-wife, outside reproduction, which I call the equation of sexual desire. Uh, so just say that I do, I'm just showing the obvious in those two. And then finally, I deploy the hacked x to see what happens when the equations are hacked. What I find is x equal zero minus y, which reads as if a male is equivalent to the thing without the form.
First, the patriarchal equation of biological reproduction, which is presumed in modern national legal racial scientific texts. It can be represented as XX plus XY leads to XX or XY, where XX indicates female and XY indicates male. Plus means with, not in addition, but a union of two different sex and um, the, the arrow means that both are present in the offspring, XX or XY. Now, what if we were to take the father X out of the equation, which is what you have here? If the offspring is female, then XX leads to XX, um, XX plus XY leads to XX. So that is, it leads to no reproduction, but only repetition, no difference between her and the outcome. There is no offspring, just the same female without uh, a male XY. If the offspring is male, again, there is no outcome. Only the mother, which is without the father, the zero, um, sorry. Only mother, only mother, which is without a father, XX becomes zero. That is, the male, he is nullified with the disappearance minus of the, fe, of the male particle. In these two possibilities, we find that the female particle cannot represent or reproduce or inform without the male. All it does is to copy herself, another female, or nullify uh, the male form. Well, this is patriarchy, no, nothing new here. So, Let's see what happens under the patriarchal colonial form where XX leads zero, or the female slave and native body. Already, so here it, it already describes a female in the equation of sexual reproduction. So if zero plus, so if you have zero plus XY in the female offspring, and then you have zero plus XX, the male offspring. Here, as in the case of Du Bois' family, without the mother or the wife as zero, the father represents himself in the male or female offspring. So this is patriarchy again. Um, indeed, it is hopeless. It's a hopeless situation if we keep the terms of sexual difference, XX and XY, where Y consistently represents the subject um, for it is precisely because a zero, the sexual female native slave body is not form, forming or informed, but yet still a sexual ident uh, entity, it plays no role in the determination of the offspring, racial or sexual identification. And more importantly, without it, there is no ambiguity or ambivalence in terms of this assignation. It is for this reason that even as an absence, it cannot possibly be equated with the Derrida's trace or the play of difference. The female sexual body uh, forms nothing, causes nothing, though it remains necessary for issuing what will be informed, the term decide, resolved by the father. Now, what if the equation without reproduction, reproduction the sexual equation without reproduction, without the mother and the wife, um, where the genetic codes XS and XY image male or female desire, what would happen? So under the, any patriarchal circumstances, the equation of sexual desire can be transformed to read that XX leads to minus XY, or XY lead, leads to minus XX, where male and female appears in, appears in mutual determination. This is the account of the other in Hegel's philosophy and in Lacan's version of psychoanalysis. She, the other, as a negation, lack, is what he, the subject, is when lacking the ability to self-represent and vice versa. Each signifies the death, the minus, of the other. That is negation without the possibility of sublation. But what happens if we activate that the hacked um, female and do so to hack the equation of sexual desire? So instead of XX plus XY leads uh, to zero, by adding the hack, which is the mark that has the ability to suspend the usual meaning of anything following it, we have that hacked X plus XY, where hacked XX stands for XX equals zero. Um, now the hacked female, never mother or wife, becomes zero, the cipher, the planner. Um, and you can see it in both, in the, 
both in relation to the plus when you add x combined with x, y in relation to that. And then if you rearrange, and the rearranging here, just to, to remind you, is just a matter of moving um, the letters across the different, the different signs. Um, but anyway, instead of, instead of x, x plus um, x, y leading to zero, by adding the hack, which is a mark that has the ability to suspend the meaning of anything following it, we have that hack x plus x, y leads to zero. Um, now the hacked female never becomes the zero, the cipher. And in, when that happens, the equation of sexual desire transfigures if, if so, then the equation of sexual desire transfigures as zero plus x, y leading to zero, a composite that can be rearranged again. Let's see if I have it here. No, I don't have it here yet. Um, just take my word for it, because this PowerPoint just quit on me. Um, <laughs> uh, OK, sorry. Oh, I can rearrange as uh, zero leading to zero minus x, y, or even better, x, y leads to zero minus zero. That is the hacked x sexual female and native body disappears with the father, but I want to show you that. Come on, help me here. I'm not quite there yet, that's why I can't go there. But it disappears with the, with the father, the form, and hence with the determination itself, as minus xy, or even better, as xy leads to zero minus zero, or zero plus xy transfigures into xy leading to zero minus zero, and that, in that case, zero we would represent the plenum itself. Uh, in, so here, it is mere potentiality of form or the play of difference that is the trace when we, we have, I want to show you that one. That one comes, this one here. Um, so what if then I hack the equation, now I'm going where I want. I hack the equation of sexual reproduction with x um, the hack the X, which is the figuring of the female who represents, uh, never represents the subject. Um, now, because as zero, the sexual female is not for, no, wait, I'm going. Okay, let me just move to, back to this one, where the hacked female figures without the male particle, minus uh, what we have there is minus x, y, and then plus the plenum. So this is what I want to register with matter before or without form, or one, what we could call materia prima, uh, materia prima. But if we further explore the hacked transfigurative capability then, it is possible to image this, in which by moving the axis around, I can split the sexual signifier x, x into hacked x and x, then releasing the sexual in the, female, in the female body from the biological signification of femaleness. So if then I move the second x, so I split the x, x, moving the second x um, so the other side of the equation, which is the moment of becoming, and that allows me, so that's the second one, and that allows me to move the, lat the letter to the other side of the equation where it divides rather than multiply. That's the, that's the middle. If I follow the steps of this procedure and cancel out the axis in the fractured, fractured side of sexual signification, the figure of an x now stands as hacked x equals minus y plus zero. That is the unmeasurable, uncalculable, and determinable in space-time, the form, or the real without form, including the Kantian pure intuitions of space-time, but then she becomes as a plan, the plenum, the plus zero, the undeterminable, limited possibilities of unthinkable, uninformed matter. For without the form of the subject, the signifier of the phallus, the ruler of meaning in figurings of universal reason as nomos or poesis, that is the thing, or the otherwise than the world as we know it. Nobody's mother, no one's wife. Chandler's figure of an ax hacked to signify the sexual in the female body. That, that is, becomes that which never enters in the scene of determination a subject of desire, either as decision or a subject of just sound. Just, so just to finish up, I'm, I think in 30 seconds, female flesh and gendered, what sense of being can be gathered after, after she hacks the sexual equation? So well, for one thing, because without the demand for determination, decision, which is the origin or the Cartesian formulation of the question of being as a quest 
for determination, that is, out from outside the philosophical account of desire and the psychoanalytic translation of it as an unconscious determinate, while being is released from the necessity to ascertain or access truth, which modern thought has had to deal with when the recourse to a divine ruler and creator was not an option. This, I, I find, is the gift of the acts, the possibility of being the world anew, of becoming of in the world without the presumed necessity for resolution and determination, and thus without the modes of knowing framed in the logic of opposition, aquinas, or sublation. Hegel, which always already described existence as a scene of violence, and imposed the necessity of domination or obliteration as in a hierarchical ordering, a natural history, or as a deadly struggle for existence in evolution. When contemplating the radical possibilities of the acts, I'm obviously still hovering over the domain of thought within the parameters name Chandler set out in his reading of Du Bois' rendering of the problem of the Negro. But please note that my response to the call is not to rush and abandon the tools for thinking and existing that aid in the confrontation of the instances of total murder and practical everything else racial violence in all its moments, which political, economic, and symbolic, symbolic instances that seem to multiply endlessly in the global present. So no, my, my response is simply, let's use the tools with caution, aware of their capacity to reproduce racial violence. And at the same time, let's move onward, assembling tools with which to think and live in the world otherwise. Because I'm convinced that, as my experiment with hacking the patriarch form would have indicated, uh, if this PowerPoint had behaved, what lies without the equations in which the sexual and the black female body means nothing, is nothing by which I mean everything and anything. So uh, we have some time for some questions, so I'm going to open the floor um, to your responses. After the seminar, we had questions about your before. And um, at the beginning of this talk, when you were talking about the black female, I wanted you to um, restate something, but you said she is beyond because she is before and against. So can you just tell us about the before? The, um, because it's not a temporal before. Yes, and it's not, yeah, but, well, I'm sorry. Um, every time I use before, I always uh, try to highlight some other way that I, I'm talking about before especially, um, which is um, also part of what, which is also the possible, one way of um, apprehending uh, blackness, even if it's as already a product of knowledge. So. And I think that's where the, really the radical possibilities uh, emerge. So if you think in terms of blackness and black femaleness emerging, being constituted through the, the tools of raciality, you know, the tools of productive violence, they do present an object, an object that is to be sublated, but cannot be sublated, so it's an object to be obliterated. However, we can think of the relationship between the object and subject as in that way. Um, take that relationship out of any appropriation of Hegel's lordship bondsman, so there is no movement here, right? The dialectical movement does not operate. So that's why this thing allows me to visualize, um, which is that the transformation taking place at the same time as one stands before another. Um, in that. So, and with, that, this, with this image, then you can see both uh, the opposition, the, the, opposition um, the possibility of nullification, which is represented by the zero, right? which then accounts for violence and the, you know, and the need for obliteration. Um, and you see the and the, you can acknowledge that the possibility of, ob of um, obliteration in the object, let's right? make this object this one, that possibility is both, it both, both responds to the continuous violence and total partial and uh, total violence, thinking in terms of blackness, but it also refers to the impossibility of disappearing with the object, because that object becomes so because it's standing outside, out there. 
not, uh, not out there in terms of being outside representation, I'm not thinking out there in that sense, but literally out there in that in sense of before. So this, is what I, um, this kind of imaging allows me f at least to think with, to stay with the violence, to stay with the violence which is in racial representation and in juridical and economic, um, in the juridical and economic moments of, of existence, and then at the same time to image blackness on the other side of it, right? So when we're talking about toward earlier today, this is, is it, this is the facing. You can see that relationship. We can look at this relationship in a Marxist way and look at the struggle or the lack of struggle when you think of slavery because a slave is the one who should not to, to die. But you can also think, think of this as pointing towards the possibility of standing here facing towards something else. Uh, thank you. Um, this is, is so, so, so wonderful and generative, and I have so many questions. I'm glad I'll have a chance to talk about them later, but just a kind of observation and a question. I mean, the observation is that the structure of your, or like the mode of argumentation, which proceeds through the formalization of these uh, structures and symbolic systems, where it kind of has, you know, and, and, the, and the kind of offering of, of hacking as a kind of black feminist tactic, right? I think has connotations for um, an engagement with the digital. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if that's in somewhere in, in the project to think about the implications because, and the digital not just in terms of computing, but also mm -hmm. in terms of binary code and, mm -hmm. and, and what becomes possible when you condense a system to a set of um, formal symbols that then can be manipulated, you know, and as you say, misread <laughs> yes. or misused, right? Mm -hmm. And the question though is, for the misreading, which I think is actually a reading of a Chandler, maybe a reading in, in, in many senses, inflections of the term, um, <laughs> that um, there's something in translating it for myself, for my own purposes, and my limited mathematical abilities back into kind of um, ordinary language, right? It seems that what's surfacing for me is a distinction that you would like us to attend to between, on the one hand, nothingness, or the cipher, and then like a process of subtraction or negation. Yes. Uh, and if you could speak more about what kinds of political implications that distinction that you're offering for mm -hmm. us and manipulating really wonderfully holds for our thinking about like refusal. Ah, huge question. Hopefully, we come up with an answer tomorrow. <laughs> but I'll try, and you know. Hope, please don't record it because I'll probably say I didn't mean it. Um, <laughs> so yeah, it's, um, definitely I, it's, it's painful, it's really painful trying to make that distinction, always wondering whether or not and how, and how it holds between negation and, and nothing else. And it's, and it's painful because um, we, well, we tend to read negation and nothing else as the same, and I think that is a Sartrean reading of negation which makes it into nothingness, and the open possibilities of nothingness, you know, they, it's not there available for thought. Now, what do we do with it? Um, I think one of, one, one of the, I, I, it's not that I think, one of the things, one of the things I'm trying to do with it uh, right now is to go back to the slave, uh, to the lordship slave, um, lordship bondsman passage and read it away from Marx. So read it away from Marx by, for instance, and for our appropriation of the Marxist rendering of it, which is behind any notion of consciousness, reading it away from it by, for instance, bringing out that which in, in Hegel's description stands for nothingness, which is death. So we usually read it and assume, assuming that, okay, that is the lordship and the master and the slave, and that's what describes our political context. But what if we took the dead, into the possibility of dying, which is always a possibility that defines this, the slave into account. Right? Now, not the possibility of dying as to then immediately associated with the fear, which is the shame of the oppressed, but the possibility of dying as that which registered all, every oppressed, who, wh whether or not they fought, they died. 
under conditions of racial, colonial violence and racial violence. And bringing those dead subjects as part of our thinking of the contemporary political scene. What if we do so? What kind of imaging of the black or any, any subject would have um, would come into being? How, what, um, what claims, what kind of claims we would be able to make if we always acknowledge that in the same way that authority is there in the juridical subject as we know it, even though we say, oh, it is, well, when, it, when we identify that authority to say it's all oh, those are hierarchical things which should not be part of modernity. So that's the move. The move is that authority, the authority of the patriarch is there. So we have not only three, but uh, four attributes which actually are the attributes that give sense to our, um, to the political struggles in which we are involved and which we always have to translate in relationship to the other three attributes, which are the universalizing ones, before which we're crazy. So that's on the one hand. And then on the other hand, uh, and that's part of my, the book I'm, I'm working on now, following through Marx, uh, through Hegel and Marx, then what kinds of figuring of the political subject we can have if, in addition to recognizing the, sub, the, the, the formal subjects, authority, in addition to recognize that authority is in the structure of the formal subject, we also recognize that death is in the structure of the, polit of the context of domination. Because, you know, uh, the master can always kill the slave. Um, right? So that's what I'm trying to do. Um, I just had a quick question about the difference between the, the X figure and um, Derrida's trace, and then also the distinction you drew between this talk and what Judith Butler says about um, the absolute outside. I was just wondering if you could go into those differences a little bit more. Um, okay, that's, uh, that's also huge. So with, with Derrida, it teaches me not to mention those things. So with, uh, with um, it's not the same, actually, the two distinctions I'm making. I'm, I'm, I don't think I'm talking about the same thing, even though I maybe go, go back and think and find out that I am. But in the case of, uh, I don't have it. So the hack is exactly the opposite of the, other, of, of the trace. And that's my playing also with these distinctions. And, but the emphasis, the, the point in making the distinction is, is structure. So the trace, even though it's, un it's unstable, when it, it creates, it is a structure of signification that ties things that are unstable and high and erases that which has to be eliminated. But it does create a structure, hence the construction. The construction wouldn't be even an, in, in, in the Derridian take of it, wouldn't even be a project if, the struck, if there was not, no acknowledgement of the structuring. Uh, that's why I have that quote from uh, uh, Spivak, because she says, even if he inhabits structuralism, yes, he totally inhabits structuralism and bringing structuralism into that. So the hack, the backslash, the hack does, and it's, it's kind of cheeky because, okay, so what do we do with the structure? You hack it. Um, so I'm totally forgetting, in a way, the Redai's statement that the structure is unstable, et cetera, et cetera. Yes, we know that. And yet, because the structure it still does its work. So what we need is not to just to say that it's unstable. We need to destroy it, to dissolve it. So that's on the one hand. Now, in relationship to Butler, to his, um, so there is and, and Butler's statement on um, the constitutive outside. Um, well, actually, see, as I think now, it is, right? It is tied to that structure at, at the same time. But there, here, I was um, more um, interested, even though I didn't have time to talk about, about how they account for matter, because in Butler's reading of Derrida and Foucault in that chapter of uh, Bodies That Matter, she again colonizes matter under the rules of discourse, and she can, you know, saying that there is no, it is impossible to conceive of a matter without form. Yeah, of course, because form is conception, is the conceptualizing of that. So that's why. I talk about it and then somewhere else I say that you can't conceptualize matter without form or you can't conceptualize the, the sexual and the female body but you can contemplate it, you can imagine it. But the moment of conceptualizing is the moment of informing. So that is, that's, that's part, this is part of the limits, right? The limits that of a 
critical discourse that has necessarily to inhabit that which it is uh, undoing, unpacking, because otherwise it will not make sense, hence nonsense. Uh, the exercise in nonsense is trying to not do it, even though using, you know, those terms, but using them to visualize something and not to organize a statement. There is no rule. Um. I love the numbers and equations. Thank you so much. Um, this is just me thinking out loud and trying to follow um, the, the paths that you are charting for us. I'm wondering, I understand how you're, you're getting there, but I'm wondering in terms of Spiller's argument and her talking about the symbolics of gender, um, and I'll make this really brief, can we get at this without the XX and the XY? Wouldn't sort of, and what's the relationship between the symbolics of gender and, and the XX and the XY? Mm -hmm. and I, to can say we about get at, uh, at these? Uh, these <laughs> <laughs> no, can we get at these? Uh, the solution? Uh, are, what, uh, are we stuck in this loop? I, I guess mm -hmm. is what I'm asking. Because I mean, to me, in, in my reading of Spillers, one of the things that she's saying is that we can't fall back, and, and this is what um, what I heard you say at the beginning, that we can't really fall back um, on femaleness or um, femininity, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So then, why start with XX and XY? Just to bring down what I'm to the, trying to understand. Uh, mm -hmm. Just to bring uh, uh, out the possibility of hacking it and splitting and dissolving uh, the form itself. Okay. That's why I started with X, X, and X, Y. Okay. And then we can then we can begin with the hacked X, which is minus Y plus um, anything that is possible. So the starting with it is a way, and, and that's also why I start with the zero and ones as a way to note value and what's valid, valid and not. As I said, reproducing critiques that we have advanced as we, you know, in our years and years of critical thought, feminist and, and black thought and other kinds of critical thought. But I wanted to image it without using the concept. That's why to do that. That's, uh, that's why I said, okay, the first equation of, when I solve the equation of sexual reproduction, I get patriarchy. When I solve the equation of sexual desire, I get patriarchy. I get patriarchy all the time within those things. So what you have to do, because, and those are the terms we use, right? We need you, the concept. So we need to do something to get out of patriarchy, and that's the exercise. This is the exercise that is done. It's not, that's why it doesn't do nothing else beyond what it does, right? So what if we could just break the XY already with it, but something that only the hacked X can do in the, in, in the moving, in the procedure. Um, so that's why. 